Welcome to reading. We're going to continue with our book, Number the Stars. Here we go. All right. Amory thought and understood. She relaxed. Mr. Rosen doesn't have a shop. He's a teacher. They can't close a whole school. She looked at Peter with a question in her eyes. Can they? I think the Rosens will be all right, he said, but you keep an eye on your friend Ellen and stay away from the soldiers. Your mother told me about what happened on Osterbrook. Amory shrugged. She had almost forgotten the incident. It was nothing. They were only bored and looking for someone to talk to, I think. She turned to her father. Papa, do you remember what you heard the boy say to the soldier that all of Denmark would be the king's bodyguard? Her father smiled. I have never forgotten it, he said. Well, Amory said slowly, now I think that all of Denmark must be bodyguard for the Jews as well. So we shall be, Papa replied. Peter stood. I must go, he said, and you, long legs, it is way past your bedtime now. He hugged Amory again. Later, once more in her bed beside the warm cocoon of her sister, Amory remembered how her father had said three years before that he would die to protect the king, that her mother would too. And Anne Marie, seven years old, had announced proudly that she also would. Now she was 10, with long legs and no more silly dreams of pink frosted cupcakes. And now she and all the Danes were to be bodyguard for Ellen and Ellen's parents and all the Den of Denmark's Jews. Would she die to protect them, truly? Amory was honest enough to admit there in the darkness to herself that she wasn't sure. For a moment she felt frightened, but she pulled the blanket up higher around her neck and relaxed. It was all imaginary. Anyway, not real. It was only in fairy tales that people were called upon to be so brave to die for one another. Not in real life, Denmark. Oh, there were soldiers, that was true. And the courageous resistance leaders who sometimes lost their lives, that was true too. But ordinary people like the Rosens and the Johansons? Amory admitted to herself, snuggling in there in the quiet dark, that she was glad to be an ordinary person who would never be called upon for courage. Chapter four, it will be a long night. Alone in the apartment while mama was out shopping with Kirsty, Amory and Ellen were sprawled on the living room floor playing with paper dolls. They had cut the dolls from mama's magazines, old ones she had saved from past years. The paper ladies had old fashioned hairstyles and clothes and the girls had given them names from mama's very favorite book. Mama had told Amory and Ellen the entire story of Gone with the Wind and the girls thought it much more interesting and romantic than the king and queen tales that Kirsty loved. Come, Melanie, Amory said, walking her doll across the edge of the rug. Let's dress for the ball. All right, Scarlet, I'm coming, Ellen replied in a sophisticated voice. She was a talented performer. She often played the leading roles in school dramatics. Games of the imagination were always fun when Ellen played. The door opened and Kirsty stomped in, her face tear-stained and glowering. Mama followed her with an exasperated look and a package down on, and set a package down on the table. I won't, Kirsty sputtered. I won't ever, ever wear them. Not if you chain me in a prison and beat me with sticks. Hamory giggled and looked questioningly at her mother. Mrs. Johansson sighed. I bought Kirsty some new shoes, she explained. She's outgrown her old ones. Goodness, Kirsty, Ellen said, I wish my mother would get me some new shoes. I love new things, and it's so hard to find them in the stores. Not if you go to a fish store, Kirsty bellowed, but most mothers wouldn't make their daughters wear ugly fish shoes. Kirst Kirsten, Mama said soothingly, you know it wasn't a fish store, and we were lucky to find shoes at all. Kirsty sniffed. Show them, she commanded. Show Anne-Marie and Ellen how ugly they are. 
Mama opened the package and took out a pair of little girl's shoes. She held them up and Kirsty looked away disgusted. You know there's no leather anymore, Mama explained, but they found a way to make shoes out of fish skin. I don't think these are too ugly. Amory and Ellen looked at the fish skin shoes. Amory took one in her hand and examined it. It was odd looking, the fish scales were visible, but it was a shoe and her sister needed shoes. It's not so bad, Kirsty, she said, lying a little. Ellen turned the other one over in her hand. You know, she said, it's only the color that's ugly. Green, Kirsty wailed. I will never, ever wear green shoes. In our apartment, Ellen told her, my father has a jar of black, black ink. Would you like these shoes better if they were black? Kirsty frowned. Maybe I would, she said finally. Well then, Ellen told her, tonight, if your mama doesn't mind, I'll take the shoes home and ask my father to make them black for you with his ink. Mama laughed. I think that would be a fine improvement. What do you think, Kirsty? Kirsty pondered. Could he make them shiny, she asked. I want them shiny. Ellen nodded. I think he could. I think they'll be quite pretty, black and shiny. Kirsten, Kirsty nodded. All right then, she said, but you mustn't tell anyone they are fish. I don't want anyone to know. She took her shoes, holding them disdainfully, and put them on a chair. Then she looked with interest at the paper dolls. Can I play too? Kirsty asked. Can I have a doll? She squatted beside Amory and Ellen on the floor. Sometimes Amory thought Kirsty was such a pest, always butting in. But the apartment was small and there was no other place for Kirsty to play. And if they told her to go away, Mama would scold. Here, Amory said and handed her sister a cut out little girl doll. We're playing Gone with the Wind. Melanie and Scarlett are going to a ball. You can be Bonnie. She's Scarlett's daughter. Kirsty danced her doll up and down happily. I'm going to the ball, she announced in a high pretend voice. Ellen giggled. <laughs> a little girl wouldn't go to a ball. Let's make them go someplace else. Let's make them go to Trivoli. Trivoli, Emory began to laugh. That's in Copenhagen. Gone with the wind is in America. Trivoli, Trivoli, Trivoli. Little Kirsty sang, twirling her doll in a circle. It doesn't matter because it's only a game anyway, Ellen pointed out. Trivoli can be over there by that chair. Come, Scarlet, she said using her doll voice. We shall go to Trivoli to dance and watch the fireworks. And maybe there will be some handsome men there. Bring your silly daughter, Bonnie, and she can ride on the carousel. Amory grinned and walked her scarlet toward the chair that Ellen had designated as Trivoli. She loved Trivoli Gardens in the heart of Copenhagen. Her parents had taken her there often when she was a little girl. She remembered the music and the brightly colored lights, the carousel and ice cream, and especially the magnificent fireworks in the evenings, the huge colored splashes and bursts of light in the evening sky. I remember the fireworks best of all, she commented to Ellen. Me too. And I remember the fireworks. Silly, Amory scoffed. You never saw the fireworks. Trivoli Gardens was closed now. The German occupation forces had burned part of it, perhaps as a way of punishing the fun-loving Danes for their lighthearted pleasures. Kirsty drew herself up, her small shoulders stiff. I did too, she said belligerently. It was my birthday. I woke up in the night and I could hear the booms and there were lights in the sky. Mama said it was fireworks for my birthday. Then Anne-Marie remembered. Kirsty's birthday was late in August. And that night, only a month before, she too had been awakened and frightened by the sound of explosions. Kirsty was right. The sky in the southeast had been ablaze and Mama had comforted her by calling it a birthday celebration. Imagine such fireworks for a little girl five years old, Mama had said, sitting on her bed holding the dark curtain aside to look through the window at the lighted sky. The next evening's newspaper had told the sad truth. 
the Danes had destroyed their own naval fleet, blowing up the vessels one by one as the Germans approached to take over the ships for their own use. How sad the king must be, Anne-Marie had heard Mama say to Papa when they read the news. How proud, Papa had replied. It had made Anne-Marie feel sad and proud too, to picture the tall aging king, perhaps with tears in his blue eyes as he looked at the remains of his small navy, which now lay submerged and broken in the harbor. I don't wanna play anymore, Ellen, she said suddenly and put her paper doll on the table. I have to go home anyway, Ellen said. I have to help Mama with the house cleaning. Thursday is our new year. Did you know that? Why is it yours? asked Kirsty. Is it, it our new year too? No, it's the Jewish new year. That's just for us. But if you want, Kirsty, you can come that night and watch Mama light the candles. Amory and Kirsty had often been invited to watch Mrs. Rosen light the Sabbath candles on Friday evenings. She covered her head with a cloth and said a special prayer in Hebrew as she did so. Anne-Marie always stood very quietly, awed to watch. Even Kirsty, usually such a chatterbox, was always still at that time. They didn't understand the words or the meaning, but they could feel what a special time it was for the Rosens. Yes, Kirsty agreed happily. I'll come and watch your mama light the candles and I'll wear my new black shoes. But this time was to be different. Leaving for school on Thursday with her sister, Anne-Marie saw the Rosens walking to the synagogue early in the morning, dressed in their best clothes. She waved to Ellen, who waved happily back. Lucky Ellen, Anne-Marie said to Kirsty, she doesn't have to go to school today. Lucky Ellen. But she probably has to sit very, very still like we do in church, Kirsty pointed out. That's no fun. That afternoon, Mrs. Rosen knocked at their door, but didn't come inside. Instead, she spoke for a long time in a hurried, tense voice to Anne-Marie's mother in the hall. When Mama returned, her, vo her face was worried, but her voice was cheerful. Girls, she said, we have a nice surprise. Tonight, Ellen will be coming to stay overnight and be our guest for a few days. It isn't often we have a visitor. Kirsty clapped her hands in delight. But Mama, Amory said in dismay, it's their new year. They were going to have a celebration at home. Ellen told me that her mother managed to get a chicken someplace and she was going to roast it, their first roast chicken in a year or more. Their plans have changed, Mama said briskly. Mr. and Mrs. Rosen have been called away to visit some relatives, so Ellen will stay with us. Now, let's get busy and put clean sheets on your bed, Kirsty. You may sleep with Mama and Papa tonight and we'll let the big girls giggle together by themselves. Kirsty pouted. It was clear she was about to argue. Mama will tell you a special story tonight, her mother said. One just for you. About a king? Kirsty asked dubiously. About a king, if you wish, Mama replied. All right then, but there must be a queen too, Kirsty said. Though Mrs. Rosen had sent her chicken to the Johansons, and Mama had made a lovely dinner large enough for second helpings all around. It was not an evening of laughter and talk. Ellen was silent at dinner. She looked frightened. Mama and Papa tried to speak of cheerful things, but it was clear that they were worried, and it made Anne Marie worry too. Only Kirsty was unaware of the quiet tension in the room. Swinging her feet in their newly blackened and shiny shoes, she chattered and giggled during dinner. Early bedtime tonight, little one, Mama announced after the dishes were washed. We need extra time for the long story I promised about the king and queen. She disappeared with Kirsty into the bedroom. What's happening? Anne-Marie asked when she and Ellen were alone with Papa in the living room. Something's wrong. What is it? Papa's face was troubled. I wish I could protect you children from this knowledge, he said quietly. Ellen, you already know. Now we must tell Anne-Marie. He turned to her and stroked her hair with his gentle hand. This morning at the synagogue, the rabbi told his congregation that the Nazis have taken the synagogue list of all the Jews, where they live, what their names are. Of course, the Rosens were on that list, along with many others. Why? Why did they want those names? They planned to arrest all the Danish Jews, 
They plan to take them away, and we have been told that they may come tonight. I don't understand. Take them where? Her father shook his head. We don't know where, and we don't really know why. They call it relocation. We don't even know what that means. We only know that it is wrong, and it is dangerous, and we must help. Amory was stunned. She looked at Ellen and saw that her best friend was crying silently. Where are Ellen's parents? We must help them too. We couldn't take all three of them. If the Germans came to search our apartment, it would be clear that the Rosens were here. One person we can hide, not three. So Peter has helped Ellen's parents to go elsewhere. We don't know where. Ellen doesn't know either, but they are safe. Ellen sobbed aloud and put her face in her hands. Papa put his arm around her. They are safe, Ellen. I promise you that. You will see them again quite soon. Can you try hard to believe my promise? Ellen hesitated, nodded, and wiped her eyes with her hand. But Papa, Anne-Marie said, looking around the small apartment with its few pieces of furniture, the fat stuffed sofa, the table and chairs, the small bookcase against the wall. You said that we would hide her. How can we do that? Where can she hide? Papa smiled. That part is easy. It will be as your mama said. You two will sleep together in your bed and you may giggle and talk and tell secrets to each other. And if anyone comes, Ellen interrupted him. Who might come? Will it be soldiers like the ones on the corner? Anne Marie remembered how terrified Ellen had looked the day when the soldier had questioned them on the corner. I really don't think anyone will, but it never hurts to be prepared. If anyone should come, even soldiers, you too will be sisters. You are together so much, it will be easy for you to pretend that you are sisters. He rose and walked to the window. He pulled the lace curtain aside and looked down into the street. Outside, it was beginning to grow dark. Soon they would have to draw the black curtains that all the Danes had on their windows the entire city had to be completely darkened at night. In a nearby tree, a bird was singing. Otherwise, it was quiet. It was the last night of September. Go now and get into your nightgowns. It will be a long night. Anne-Marie and Ellen got to their feet. Papa suddenly crossed the room and put his arms around them both. He kissed the top of each head. Anne-Marie's blonde one, which reached to his shoulders, and Ellen's dark one, the thick curls braided, as always, into pigtails. Don't be frightened, he said to them softly. Once I had three daughters. Tonight I am proud to have three daughters again. All right, please go to Google Classroom and there is an assignment there for you.